how we help um, and hinder you know, service members transition out of the military. Um, you know, the pros and the cons, and obviously, so those that uh, have done it and may not have done it well or could use some information, they could learn from what I, what I did, mistakes I made, uh, and also the things I did that went well um, and make their transition easier, better, um, and hopefully more successful than the one that I had. If you could discuss your kind of your morning routine or even your evening routine, if you had one of those as well, um, while you were in service, while you were in uniform, and then once you transitioned out, what is that kind of morning or evening routine? How is that, how is that kind of morphed into your civilian life now currently? Okay. So my, uh, my, so my current routine is nothing like my military routine. So towards the end of my transition, I spent my last seven years um, at headquarters Marine Corps. So in DC which is very odd for, for a Marine enlisted guy um, and very odd for a Marine in general. So, you know, you work in the Pentagon, you, know, you get up, you PT on your own. So there's no, there's no structured PT at that level, right, in, in, in my career. And then you work all day, you go to the gym, and then you kind of go home and do what you got to do. But I had a lot of travel as well in the, in the Pentagon as the monitor. Um, so now transitioning, my morning routine is more, it's more focused on mental. So I'll get up, I'll drink water first. So I'll get, I'll drink water to kind of get my stuff going. Um, I'll eat blueberries and then I'll have my coffee. So obviously if you drink coffee straight with, with, um, with nothing in your gut, it's bad for you, right? It's bad for health. So more, my focus now is more on health and mental, um, you know, just my mental preparation for the day. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll wake up, I'll drink water and then I'll get blueberries. I'll get coffee and then I'll take some time to do some deep breathing and some meditation. Um, and then I kind of, you know, log in and, and, and get to work. So my focus on, on mental health is primary. Uh, and prior to being, you know, retired, I really didn't focus a whole lot on my mental well-being. Do you think so that's much. because you were always go, go, go while you were in the military? And now you have, you're out of the military, you have all that time now to focus on that? So it's a couple of reasons. Um, number one, I don't think the military puts enough focus on um, the importance of mental health, right? Mm -hmm. So we care about physical, we care about physical fitness, right? We care about getting a job right. and that's kind of how we're trained, but there's yep. very little, if any focus on your mental health in terms of, um, yeah, in, in terms of, you know, deep breathing, yoga, meditation, all those things, right? And what really opened my eyes was, you know, I was very fit. For, for my whole time in the Marine Corps, first class PFTs, obviously very successful as an E9. Um, but when I got ready to retire, I was at Wounded Warrior in Fort Belvoir for PTSD, uh, PTSD and TBI treatment. And I said, hey, man, mm -hmm. I keep having heart pains, chest pains. And they're like, oh, well, you know, you're not here for that. You're here for PTSD and TBI. And I said, well, most guys and gals that have PTSD, TBI also have heart issues. So I got a, I got a consult to a doctor, to a heart doctor. Uh, and then I was getting ready to get out and I went to go get my results. And they ran all these tests. Any tests you can run, they ran on my heart. And um, they're like, oh, yeah, well, we need to call the, the, the heart doctor and he has to talk to you. You know, RN can't talk to you. So I came in, I, you know, he came in, I, he sat me down. He's like, Hey, you know, how things going? I'm like, you know, I'm okay. Um, and I was like a week from getting out of the Marine Corps and you're know, going on my scope and such. And he's like, Hey, you have an aneurysm, a heart aneurysm. And I was like, okay, well, what the hell is that? And he's like, here's the deal. He's like, you have high blood pressure. You've had a high op tempo and you've had, you know, combat stress. He's like, so your blood has been pumping faster through your arteries than it's supposed to. And in doing so it's extended your artery. So you're at, you're at, you know, 4.95 centimeters. So one or two things have, has to happen. It's like, if you continue on the path you're on with high stress, high op tempo, um, you're basically going to kill yourself because what happens with an aneurysm is that your aneurysm will, um, it'll explode. Your, art, your artery will explode and then you'll be, uh, and then you'll pretty much die. He's like, or you can change your life change your habits, change your diet, stop drinking, focus more on mental health and mindfulness. And you may have to get a heart surgery. You may not. So that was like a ton of bricks. I was like, holy crap. I'm 48 years old, had a very successful career, um, very fit. And the doctors basically tell me, if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to die. 
and I was like, oh my god, like what the hell do I do? So yeah, man, that uh, that hit me like a ton of bricks, man, because I was like, I, I thought everything was good. I was doing, I was doing well, right? Uh, and then yeah, so that really kind of was a kick in the ass. So you're fit, you're fit on the outside, right? As as Marines are usually you know, because we're harshly judged in the Marine mm-hmm. world, right? Second you walk in the door, you're automatically judging. You're looking at how well the uniform fits. And then based on that is how good of a Marine, how good of a person this is essentially, right? Okay, this guy looks good in uniform. He must know what he's talking about. That mm-hmm. we, we judge right off the bat. So you were on the, on the outside, you were fit, but mm-hmm. you believe that on the inside, you were struggling a little bit with like the mental stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. I was definitely struggling with mental health. My command yeah. didn't even know I was going to mental health counseling. I mean, I, I told the colonel right. and he had no idea I was even going to counseling or the sergeant major. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's just, um, you know, obviously after doing a career of 29, 30 years, it's the transition is different. I think it's more challenging, but yeah, I was definitely right. fit on right. the outside when you, you know, a parent to white, but not so much. Um, on the inside when it comes to mental health. And when you went to Wounded Warrior, was that the first time that you encountered something with like going and, and getting something uh, regarding mental health or like when some, was that the first time somebody suggested the mental health aspect of it? No. So um, I first believe I had symptoms of, you know, some PTSD after I came back from Somalia. So in 94, mm-hmm. after the, uh, we mm-hmm. did the UN withdraw, the Supreme Court Mew, uh, we removed Gadishu mm-hmm. for three months. Right. So I think that was my first uh, introduction okay. to to that. Uh, I went and sought help after I came back from Afghanistan in 2010 as a gunny, as an E7. Um, so I did go and seek out counseling at Camp Pendleton. So coming to Wounded Warrior was not my first time seeking mental health, but I knew in retirement that it was important for me to address my issues before I retired and transitioned. Uh, but I had sought health before. I had sought help before. And then when I went in as an E7, um, I was the only E7 in the mental health clinic in Camp Mountain. None of my peers are there. Uh, it was all younger first year Marines. They were getting, were getting help. But none of my peers, no senior officers. I was the only E7 in the clinic. Was there like, what kind of mental health regiment did they kind of put you on or suggest to you or did they give you some kind of like roadmap of what you can do to start making your way back to better mental health after you'd had this consult and after you discovered this this heart aneurysm and you're thinking okay well shit now i have to do something what's that path kind of look like so both times as an E7, as an E9, getting ready to retire, um, going and seeking, seeking some help. It was the same thing. It was like, here's medication. And then, you know, you would come in and talk about, you come in and talk about things every week, every two weeks. Um, and then towards the end, so in, in Wounded Warrior Regiment, uh, at the end at Fort Belvoir, Intrepid Spirit, they actually went more in depth. Like I had migraines, like, hey, let's do acupuncture. I'm like, okay, never had that, but let's try it. Tried it. And it helped out. So that was more of a holistic approach at the Wounded Warrior Regiment, uh, Intrepid Spirit at Fort Belvoir, which was better. It wasn't just like here's some medication, here's some, uh, you know, let's let's talk about some stuff, right? It was it was more holistic approach. They looked at diet, they looked at physical therapy, they looked at you know they looked at ment- uh, books to read. So it was it was better on the way out. But again, only those guys and gals that make it to Wounded Warrior, get that in-depth treatment. I didn't get that when I was younger as an E7. And do you think that that's something that the, the Marine Corps or the military in general could do a little bit better uh, by providing those or opening up all those resources that you were getting at Wounded Warrior to folks in the regular, like in the fleet or like in their regular garrison status? Yeah, so I think that, uh, I think it would help more if we had a more holistic approach to mental mm-hmm. health. And not just focus on, hey, let's let's talk about your you know issues or here here's some medication, right? Uh, I mean, if it was if it was like you diagnosed everything, I mean from head to toe. So you looked at physical therapy. Obviously, you have some ailments. Let's do physical therapy on those things, right? Um, and it was a PT specialist, you know, a GS12. It wasn't some you know E2 corpsman. Um, right. And then was, let's talk about gut health. Uh, let's talk mm-hmm. about you know obviously having the conversation about what's going on. But it was just a better, more holistic approach to diagnosing uh, your problems. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I, oh, you brought up gut health, and I, I didn't actually know that term until like, like two years before I retired, and yeah. uh, 
it, it was always like, oh, you know, my I got problems with my stomach. You know, you may have GERD or something like that. And uh, come to find out, everything is linked, right? I had yeah. to go to a specialist to find that out. You know, because mm-hmm. I was complaining about it so much. Similar to you, right? You you complain about it, and you know you got the treatment that you you actually needed instead of just getting pills thrown at you and saying, yeah. hey, you know, just uh, drink some water, change your socks, or whatever the hell the uh, the uh, mm-hmm. alleviation might be. But uh, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, man, because that uh, everything is linked from the gut to the mind, and, and a lot of folks don't realize that until it's yeah. too late in their career. Yeah, you know, and it's amazing because you know in the military, uh, like it or not. You know, we have a job to do, right? We have a purpose, right. you know, obviously, um, idealistically, you know, it's to support defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? And, and you like it or not, you know, you're, you know, you're trained to fight and win wars, right? But in doing so, what we don't realize, I think, is that um, in order to be a better warrior, to be a better leader, uh, there's other things that really impact that, right? So your health is crucially important. Your mindset is crucially important. So we focus on leadership, but I think there's aspects of leadership that tie to mindset and mental um, mental health, as well as your um, your diet. And, and those things I don't think are really discussed. Oh, I mean, if you look at the military in general, like... The, the ideal poster boy or poster girl for, you know, the ideal kind of soldier or Marine or airman or whatever. It's like they go to the gym six times a week and they, you know, they pack on protein and they do all these things, but really like, yes, you can get results like that. If you're training to go to war or if you're training for a Hollywood movie and you need to get a six pack real quick, like you can do those results really quick, but there's, lasting effects to doing things in such a short time frame or doing things so aggressively and it doesn't have a a good long tail on the end of that kind of regiment if that makes any sense yeah most definitely now how do you uh wayne how do you <clears throat> do you ever put your thoughts on paper like that's that's one of my routines uh and, and i know john and i talk about it extensively is you know putting your thoughts your your ideas uh, things that are bothering you, getting them off your shoulders, off your chest, and putting them into something like a notebook. Is that something that maybe you you have gotten used to doing as you've gotten out? Uh, so I do journal. Um, mm-hmm. Just started recently. There's a great thing. It's a great tool I use. It's called the Men's Journal. It's like the number one recommended uh, and reviewed men's journal in the world. It has has a series of tools, and it asks you how you feel, and there's goals and other stuff. So, yeah, journaling mm-hmm. is something I never did. It's something I never really believed in, but as I began to read more and, you know, in my transition journey, um, I realized the value of it. And I tell a lot of people, it's like, Hey man, you know, as men specifically, I was like, write down your thoughts because it appeals to your senses differently. Right. So I see it, I read it, I hear it. Um, it affects you different. Right. So I had a young man who I was helping lose some weight and I was like, Hey man, do me a favor, write down what you eat. I don't care if it's, you drink a six pack. I don't care if you eat a whole damn pizza, write it down. And he wrote it down. And I said, okay, cool. I was like, a whole day. I was like, look at that, man. I was like, what do you think about your diet? He's like, holy shit. I didn't really realize it was that bad. Until he actually visibly <laughs> saw what he was eating and drinking and yeah, how active yeah. uh, he was not. You no, know, he wasn't drinking no water. He wasn't doing nothing. He was very sedentary. He's like, he's like, man, this is amazing. I was like, yeah, man, write it down. Look at it, see it, read it. I was like, it's amazing, you know, the effect that it has on you. So journaling is very powerful. It's something I've, I've recently gotten into. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm a believer in, in writing goals down. I'm a believer in journaling. Yeah, all that stuff is, uh, it's very powerful if you take the time to uh, to do it. That's good. Yeah, because we've, we've almost like journaled our entire career, right? Like you've, I'm sure you've carried around, around like the, the green logbook things, you know, in the, in the Marine yeah. Corps. Well, you put, I mean, I've, I've showed John, I've got a whole collection of every logbook that I have throughout my entire career for the last 20 years. And in there, you put your thoughts, your feelings, your ideas, you know, you're sitting in a, in a, a brief at the base theater or something, and you're like doodling something or you're drawing, taking notes and you look back on those things. And I'm like, damn, I've been journaling really Mm -hmm. my entire career. You know, so then, yeah, it, it just makes sense, right? It makes sense. And I think a lot of folks miss out on that because they don't put their ideas and their thoughts on paper. And just like yeah. the gentleman that you talked about, you know, you don't, you have to visually see it 
in order to appreciate it, in order to to see what you're missing in life. Definitely, definitely agree, man. Journaling is powerful. And like I said, I didn't really understand the value of it until I got older um, mm-hmm. and, and gave it a try. I think even you probably did. You just probably didn't equate it to your personal life, right? Mm-hmm. So we, when we work, we write down notes, especially in the logistics field. Like you're constantly taking notes, writing down serial numbers, writing down pallet numbers and mm-hmm. trying to figure out where inventory is and where it's going and where it comes. You've got that book in the, well, some people have a book uh, say in like the supply section where you have to sign out equipment and stuff like that. So we're constantly writing things down. Mm-hmm. We're constantly tracking things in order to then feed those bits of information up to the command, up to the, the leadership so that they can have a holistic view of what's going on. Everybody kind of just feeds all that information together, but nobody, not a lot of people think about it when it comes to their personal life, like what you track and what you manage on paper is what you actually put your effort into and what you focus on. Right. So, yeah, I think it's the, uh, so I never really journal thoughts and feelings. I journal job stuff. Obviously, like Mm -hmm. I said, you know, inventory, you know, Marines leadership, but I never journaled thoughts and feelings. And that opens up a whole new world now. Oh yeah, it's still <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's positive and negative, man. But, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let, yeah, let me ask. You get about ten note ten ten notebooks into your journaling and look back on it ten years yeah. from now or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And then you have to archive those things, and then you have a whole. Then you're back in the logistics world, right? You're back in the supply world, <laughs> uh, yeah, itemizing all your journals. So let me let me ask you, Wayne. Since you have left the service. Uh, after 30 years, which is an incredible career, what has been the most enjoyable thing about you, uh, about your journey after leaving the service and, and your least enjoyable thing? Uh, so since leaving the service, I took, so when I first got out, I you know, kind of took a two-year break. Um, mm-hmm. So what's been most enjoyable is, you know, being to do what I want, what I enjoy, um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, have the freedom of time and kind of be able to do what you want to do, right? Where you want to go to, um, I live in El Paso, Texas, so if I want to walk, if I want to walk across the bridge to go to Juarez, I don't have to fill out no chit, no permission as a grown man to go to Juarez and have lunch, right? I just take my passport, <laughs> right. I walk across the bridge, I get lunch, and I come back, right? So that's freedom it. of movement, right? Least enjoyable? That's an interesting question because I, I don't, I mean, there's not really, I mean, I mean, like I said, I, I'm... You know, I always tell people it's kind of, it's very comical. It's like, hey, do you miss the Marine Corps? You know, do you, you know, what do you miss about retirement? I was like, I miss the clowns or the Marines, but I don't miss the circus, the bureaucracy, the BS, right? I miss the people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, I mean, being around young men and women that are selfless and who have volunteered to serve our country is unlike anything you'll ever do in your life, right? Our 22 year old, our 22 year old corporal. We'll be leading a squad or a fire team and have an amazing amount of privilege and responsibility as a leader. And out here, you have a 22-year-old senior in high school, a senior in college who has no responsibility, uh, doesn't want responsibility, uh, and doesn't care about anything but himself or herself. So right. probably what I, what, I, what I don't enjoy is being around um, – I miss being around those caliber of people. It's different out here. Not that not that it's bad, but it's different. Yeah, you get so used to being around that that uh, that camaraderie, that uh, that environment, yeah. right? Where it's it's very very structured, right? And I, I mm-hmm. equate the the Marine Corps and the military in general to a bubble, right? And there's an order for everything. Everything mm-hmm. is there for you if you need it, right? You have you know your allowance for housing, you have medical right down the street, everything. It's its own little world. And once you leave yeah. that world, everything kind of, you have to figure every little piece out, right? And the people are not the same. Just like you mentioned, you may have corporals who are, are great leaders because they've been pushed, they've been put in that billet and you grow where you're planted essentially. And then you have folks mm-hmm. who are, you know, 22, 23, who really don't want to get out of bed sometimes, you know, the, the, the new generations maybe don't, mm-hmm. don't, they're not the same as the folks who have volunteered for these things. Yeah. And leadership, leadership's yep. not taught out here, man. Yeah. Uh, what I've really, what yeah. I've really, what I've really seen is um, if you're a manager, it's because you're good at your job. Mm-hmm. So they teach you metrics. They teach you how to measure things. They teach you about, you know, the P and L, 
But yeah. that man that management training teaches you nothing about leadership. So these frontline supervisors and these mid level managers, they have no leadership training. They don't know how to talk to people, how to lead people. So yeah, leadership out here and management. Totally different. You said you took a, a two year break after yeah. you retired. Uh, you mind mind me asking, like, what you filled that two years with, time wise and event wise? Yeah, I did a my first three months. I did a I was a government contractor, um, mm -hmm. working from home. Uh, the company didn't get the the contract they bid, um, so you know, let that job go. I uh, started a nonprofit uh, for under underserved. Um, minority athletes, which here in El Paso is primarily Mexicanos, uh, Latinos, uh, did that for a little bit. Didn't know a whole lot about nonprofit world, so it was a little bit challenging, but it was it was enjoyable at the time. Um, I also started a frozen yogurt truck here in El Paso, so I opened the first frozen yogurt truck they ever had here because my thing was I looked around and I said, okay, cool, I'm in El Paso, it's hot as hell, 300 days of sunshine, right? <laughs> I said, um, but sense. you have, you have one of the leading, um, I mean, we are like one of the top three cities in the nation with type two diabetes and obesity mm -hmm. in the Latino community. And I said, well, what's the root cause? Well, the root cause is, um, you can't afford to eat healthy, right? Most people, cause it's super expensive. I said, there's no options. They had one options in dessert, which was Kona shave ice, which is nothing but high fructose corn syrup. Um, so my, my yogurt truck that I opened with peach wave yogurt, uh, it's not a franchise, it's a license, and they serve dairy, non-dairy, and um, sugar-free. So basically, it was a healthy is a healthy option for a dessert in a hot area, but I wasn't expensive. I'm, I wasn't charging, you know, uh, Trader Joe's or Whole Foods prices. I was basically giving a dessert right. to the community that was affordable and healthy. So yeah, Are you still doing that. Uh, so yeah, the uh, the frozen yogurt truck it's seasonal. You know, in the wintertime, people don't eat cold stuff. So, yeah, I'm getting ready to open back up here in the next month or so. Uh, but, yeah, but I, I mean, I learned a lot in the journey right, of, of being an entrepreneur. Uh, I learned a lot about people. I learned about the business process. I learned about pricing. I mean, it was just a, it was, it was a good lesson in the last Do you think your business. Your supply background or maybe your, your MOS background kind of helped you out with that? Or did you have to learn that from the ground up, you think? Uh, no, man. My uh, – so my – my inventory management skills in the Marine Corps, obviously, you know, I understood demand planning. I understood, understood forecasting. Yeah. All that, all that. So that aspect of my, of my MOS or my job in the Marine Corps definitely made it a hell of a lot easier. Good. And is that something you run on your own? Like, uh, or do you have like a team of folks that, that you employ or that run that with you? Like, are you out uh, there driving the truck? <laughs> yeah. So I'm out there driving the you truck. Uh, well, I was, okay. um, I yes. was, and then, uh, my sons would help me. And mm -hmm. then um, I basically had them in the in the truck working, and I was out front doing all the PR stuff, handing out cards, talking to people, giving out samples. Uh, but yeah, I basically was a, uh, you know, it was my sons and I who came pretty much ran it the first year. Incredible! It's and I've never done it myself personally yet, but I I would love to to try to do that, like a food cart or a, especially over here where I'm at, where there's like literally three Mexican food options here. Like everything else is Italian, of course. Yep. Um, but it's it's one of those kind of things where you can really make a killing if you if you have the right product in the right place at the right time and it just it's one of those kind of off market things that nobody else has mm -hmm. uh, and I've been to El Paso many times I love the place yep uh, it's definitely hot as hell and mm -hmm. uh, there there's not a lot of not a lot of good options around there food wise so yeah no, that, that no. makes total sense yeah nothing healthy um, and. No dessert options in the food truck market. So I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. Cornish of ice. I'm like, they're not, I'm like, they're part of the problem. I said, I want to be the solution. Yeah. I want to offer something that's healthy and affordable you know, to our community that's being plagued with obesity and type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So now, when you mentioned, uh, you know, your sons help you out with this, would joining the military, the Marine Corps be something that you would talk to your <laughs> sons about? So, funny thing Is you that, say that, man. Uh, yeah. My nephew just joined the Marine Corps. Uh, mm -hmm. about six months ago, my son, who's 16, I mean, obviously he got lucky, right? So all my sons got lucky. They were born at the age. I was my first son at 35. I was an E7. So, you know, I was E8 in Hawaii. I was an E9 in the Pentagon. So, you know, I took him to, you know, took him to the white house. You know, I took him to the Supreme court. You know, he met the Supreme. So he had all the easy stuff. Right. Um, right. So 
he was really never really talking about the Marine Corps. He was actually kind of anti-military. And I was cool with that. I never pushed my sons to join the military. As a matter of fact, I was more telling them not to join. I was like, go yeah. to college. I serve so you don't have to. Do what you right. got to do. You know, be a free thinker or whatever. Excuse me. Um, but my son went to his first cousin's boot camp graduation and then came back and was like, I'm going to be a Marine. I was like, not happening. <laughs> I was like, what else do you want to do? He's like, oh, I want to fly. I said, okay, cool. Let's do let's do fly school. And then he was like, you know, hey, no, nah, you know, I want to join. I was like, okay, cool. Why do you want to join? And he's like, well, here's why I want to join. I was like, okay, cool. So um, whether he actually goes through it and joins, you know, who knows? But his mindset has shifted a little bit more closer towards graduation. I've seen the positives and the negatives of the military, right? Being a, being a crew Marine. Uh, mm-hmm. I tell everybody that it's good to serve our country. Um, it doesn't have to be the military. It can be local, state, or federal. Uh, but you should do some form of service. Uh, it doesn't have to be military. And obviously, being being a combat veteran, I've seen I've seen the atrocities of war, and uh, the effects, both during and after, on our on our um, on our military service members, male and female. So, I'm cool if my sons don't join the military, and I don't push it. You don't mind? I'd like to kind of zoom in on this. Uh, we'll probably hit it a couple of times throughout the interview, but I want to really zoom in on this, this age range that your son is in and making the decisions and talking with you about joining the military and kind of rewind back to when you first started thinking about it, where you were, what your mindset was, and what was like the trigger point that then allowed you to join uh, the Marine Corps. So he was, he's, he's like 15, 16, kind of like when he really, you know, started conversing about it. Uh, I yep. was 12. So my stepdad was in the army in Fort Huachuca. We lived on base. Um, he ran the NCO club. Uh, I always saw Marines. I went to an all armed forces championship track meet and the Marines won everything. And I was like, okay, cool. I saw Marines marching. Uh, they marched, they marched in formation. Everyone always moved out of the way. They're always in step. They're always fit. The uniforms are always awesome. Right. Um, I went to a Marine Corps ball at the age of 12 and the army doesn't do Marine Corps balls like the Marine Corps does or birthday balls per se. It's like, you know, let's go to the signal Corps ball. Okay, cool. Let's go to the supply ball. You know, it's all this individual stuff, right? The Marine Corps, you're a Marine. You just go and celebrate the birthday of the Marine Corps, right? So seeing the Marine Corps birthday ball celebration, how Marines carried themselves, their discipline, their fitness. Um, obviously they have the best uniform in the military. Uh, so that's obviously impressive. Um, and then the athletes, the all armed forces track meet. I mean, they swept everything. I was like, holy crap, I'm going to be like those guys. Uh, so that was at the age of 12. Fast forward, uh, at the age of 16, I got my high school sweetheart pregnant. So I'm in 10th grade. She's a senior and she's pregnant. Holy shit, right? I had to go tell her dad, who was Army First Sergeant, that I got his daughter pregnant mm-hmm. and that didn't go too well. So two years later, I'm 18. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, got a two year old daughter. Um, want to be responsible and take care of her, obviously. I was like, so the military will do two things. They'll allow me to take care of my daughter, but also it's kind of what I want to do, right? So, yeah, I joined the Marines at eight, at 18. Actually, at 17. I was between my junior and senior year. So I got parental consent and joined at 17, spent a year in the delay, delayed entry program. And then a week after high school graduation, I joined the Marines. Great story. Yeah. It's a whole yeah. story, man. It's been a wild ride, man. <laughs> and, I, and I never planned on doing a career. I was doing my four years and get the hell out. Well, uh, you're, you're not lying with the wild ride, man. This started out before you even uh, joined the, the Marine Corps. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I mean, getting getting your high school sweetheart pregnant at 16 and you're in 10th grade. Yeah, that's it's no joke, man. Oh, God. Yeah, I can imagine and then going up to somebody. Yeah, I, I have a daughter, uh, so I imagine that somebody coming yeah. up to me and telling me that. Thank thank goodness it hasn't happened. But, you know, I, I just, yeah. at, any more, at any point in time, I got to be ready for the conversation like that. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was Army First Sergeant, Vietnam vet. Yeah. He was not happy. <laughs> no. Can't imagine he was. No. And she was a senior in high school. So, yeah. Last year of school, get ready to graduate. And then she's pregnant. I'm like, yeah. Tough. So where, uh, where was your first duty station after you, you finished boot camp and all that? So, yeah. Finished boot camp. Went to MCT at Camp Lejeune. And then just mm-hmm. went right across the street to uh, Second Supply Battalion. In Camp Lejeune. Okay. Oh, right yeah. on. Okay. Right there. Yeah, right there in front, right there in French Creek. Yeah. How'd you like uh, yeah. Camp Lejeune? A lot of things to do, huh? 
No, nah, no, nah, especially in the in the early nineties, man. Um, oh. It was. It's not like it is today. I mean, you had you had Court Street, you yeah. had you know you had the Driftwood, you had lots of stuff in the nineties, uh, but nothing really to do, right? Uh, yeah. I only spent I only spent two years there because I spent two years on on the Mew. Um, mm-hmm. So I spent I spent um I spent you know two years you know. A year deployed and a year doing workups. So I didn't spend right. out of my four years. I spent two years of this unit and two years deployed. Almost, yeah, man. Yeah, crazy. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's things to do out there now. I was out there recently. Mm-hmm. The Driftwood is still out there, right, right outside yeah. the gate. They changed you know, the name with now. their silly sides. Did they re- recently change the name? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how it's oh, there. Man. So I've been oh man. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. They changed the name, but it's still there. Ah, <laughs> but I've not ne- I've not been just for the record. But uh, no, it's um, oh, I did definitely younger man. Some, something you, you got to do yeah. when you're eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I never had the chance. I was I was already uh, what was I? I was I was a staff sergeant. I'd hear the the stories coming out of the driftwood, and I didn't want to. You know, I, I like I wanted to keep my rank. You know, oh, yeah. at that point, yeah, you're, time, a legal, so. you're a legal guy too, so you're probably pretty straight and narrow. Like said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I, I heard all the uh, the bad <laughs> stuff coming out of there, and. Had to give briefs on that stuff, so I was like, "Man, let me let me stay out of there." So, yeah. But you know, I, I hear Walmart is just as active with all that stuff, though. Oh, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm target myself, man. I'm a I'm a target. I'm kind of bougie. You're a target like man. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. Something. I'm thinking about that. I think he's up. I think he's up. <laughs> yeah. Go to Starbucks. Oh, get my coffee and walk around. You know. Yeah. So let, let me ask you. So after after you got out, right? You obviously, you know, you had. I, I assume that you had a, a pretty lengthy medical record from, you know, your time and, you know, going mm-hmm. through all these uh, medical appointments and things like that. And then when it came yeah. time to do your VA process, submitting everything, how did that go? Was it a smooth process submitting everything and getting your VA rating or was there bumps in the road with that? So for me, uh, I did mm-hmm. not do the BDD. Um, mm-hmm. I went to Wounded Warrior and obviously had a lot of, a lot of documentation, right? Uh, I wanted to do my appointments in the same place I retired. So I didn't feel, mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't give, um, I didn't go to a VFW VSO until I got here in El Paso. So I went to Fort Bliss, okay. talked to VFW VSO, gave them all my stuff. So I didn't file my claim until I retired. Um, so I didn't, I didn't take advantage of the six month prior to and all that because I was in DC. I was going to retire in El Paso. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I did my appointments in the same place I was retiring. Right. Um, so yeah, I retired. Submitted my claim, went to all my appointments, and then got my my VA disability rating about three months afterwards. And of course, I will tell you that being a retiree over twenty years, and being an E nine, um, obviously, I think my process is different than a young guy or gal who does four years and gets out. That's right. Yeah, it, it can be. I've I've sat in those uh, transition rating to seminars, you know, and, and both both yeah. times, and uh, yeah. It's definitely a little bit better. They they give you a lot more information when you're at the 20 year mark. It's yeah, set up a little bit better, I think. Yeah, so I did, my, I did all my all my appointments. Um, then obviously got my get my VA disability rating, um, mm-hmm. and obviously was was a uh, yeah. I mean, I got what I think I deserved. I want to ask you because just because it's interesting. So just for transparency, we sent you the 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 questions like we do every guest and. Uh, funny enough, you're the first one to respond back and actually answer a lot of the questions. And one of the questions that you answered really caught my attention. So I just want to kind of dig into it. Uh, it sounds like you've already kind of done this in that like two year gap, but all the responsibilities and obligations went away. Like you didn't have to work. You didn't have to go do anything except like pay the mortgage, pay the light bill and all that stuff. Uh, and you freed up a lot of time in your life. What activities or tasks would you be adding to your life? And and you, you mentioned yoga, and I'll just uh-huh. I'll frame it with that, and then I'll let you go. Yeah, so I mean, I want I want to take more time um, to do yoga, right? I want to travel more, so I want to travel more and kind of experience some some of the cultures that are more focused on mindfulness. Um, you know, do some retreats, do some mental health retreats. I mean, so. Um, my diet's getting better. I stopped drinking alcohol. Um, more into you know hydration and mindfulness. So for me, if if I had the time and everything, I would I would you know obviously yoga right. So as you age, so I had a star major in the Pentagon. I would come down the steps every morning, and uh, Star Major Featherson would be on his head, 
doing a handstand. Mm -hmm. So one day I said, Sergeant Major, what the hell are you doing? Every time I come down here, you're, and he, did, he was a 30 year Marine and then like 20 years at GS. Uh, I said, you're always on your head. It's like, why are you on your head? And he's like, master guns. He's like, as you age, the first thing you lose is your balance. He's like, when you lose your balance, you fall. When you fall, you break bones. He's like, so if I can maintain my balance, I'm less likely to get hurt and get injured as I age. I was like, you know what? That's pretty damn smart. So um, yoga with balance and flexibility, right? As you age, uh, because I have, a, I have a long list of extremity injuries, knees, ankles, feet, all that, you know, it, it's crucially important for me to stay flexible and to maintain my balance. So yoga, mindfulness, right? Uh, it's amazing. I've taken my blood pressure and then I'll lay down and I'll do deep breathing. Mm -hmm. I'll take my blood pressure again. And it's amazing the difference when you do mindfulness techniques where it's deep breathing, meditation, and then take your blood, your, your blood pressure, uh, the difference it makes. And I was a believer in none of this stuff. I thought it was all bullshit. Acupuncture. I was like, uh, I don't really want to do acupuncture. I think it's bullshit. I don't really believe in it. And she was like, hey, give it a try. Give it a try. I was like, huh. I actually feel pretty good. So um, I become a believer of the importance and the effectiveness of, of mindfulness and a more holistic approach, approach to not only um, nutrition, but also your mental health. I feel like once you, once you get introduced to, to like the holistic medical approach in general, like whether it's acupuncture or acupressure or even yoga and meditation, things like that, like I think it has a this kind of bad connotation wrapped around those words. Mm -hmm. People talk about meditation or yoga or anything like that, mm -hmm. mindfulness. And I think once you get a taste of it, if you get a taste of it in the right way with the right people, and you're not going to some bullshit like rent a shaman. Mm -hmm. um, you can really kind of unlock something that you may not have thought about. And it really kind of just opens your mind. Um, so you've done, you've done yoga practice already, or you just some, a little bit not trying much. to get into it. I want to do more of it. Okay. Yeah, I want to do more. I was going to I was going to mention one thing to you that you may want to also look into or consider as you're talking about balance and flexibility and uh, the ability to move around and still be able to function as an adult as you age. Uh, there's another thing called uh, gymnastics sports training and basically mm -hmm. it hones in on flexibility. So flexibility from, you know, the bottom of your foot all the way up to the top of your head. And everything in between might not be what you expect it to be if you uh -huh. start to look into it, but that might be another one to take a look at. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm open to trying anything. Um, like I said, I had, I had knee surgeries, I had a compression fracture in my back, jacked up neck, shoulders, um, ankles, plantar fasciitis. I mean, you know, you know, multiple yeah. deployments, and then you know, you know, 20 plus years in the Marine Corps really beat your body up. So. Um, yeah, I'm open to trying anything, man. See if it can, if it can improve my quality of life. I'm all about it. And it's funny how, you know, the, the military in general, uh, you know, and I, and I, I'll speak to the Marine Corps because they, they equate us, especially with like things like Semper Fit and, and these, uh, these organizations, these gym organizations, right? They equate the, the military to elite athletes. Um, mm. yet, you know, they have the resources there, but I don't, I don't think that they market it enough. I, I don't think. Um, like I never personally, I never started stretching really in depth until like I was, I don't know, at my 17 year mark when mm. I started feeling like the real, like my, my muscles got really tight. And you know, at one point I, I ran the Marine Corps marathon and I completely jacked my leg up and, uh, it was just terrible. And I, there was never really a focus. It was always like, you know, the daily seven or the daily 16, and then you do like a 10 second stretch after, you know, and it was yeah. always like that. And, uh, they never, there was never really a focus on that. And now it's like you, you, you live with that for the rest of your life, trying to stretch it out. It's never going to be the same as when it was when you were 18, 19, 20. And I think, uh, I think that's one thing that the military in general could do better is by focusing on maybe these yoga things, maybe on these uh, stretching routines, you know, just an entire thing, not just, Hey, warm it up real quick. Let's go on this five mile run. And then afterwards take 10 seconds to, you know, to cool down or whatever that looks like. Right. Is, yeah. Is I mean, that so, something you think they can do better? So I partially agree. I think the resources are there. When you go to starting yeah. school, they call it now, 
career school and mm-hmm. in, in advanced school, right? They teach that stuff. Right. The problem yeah. is when the Marine comes back to the unit and tries to implement it, they're not allowed. Mm-hmm. You'll have people, you'll have, you'll have a guy in the S3 or a commander who's like, oh, we're not doing that. Or you'll have a force mm-hmm. fitness instructor. We spend all this money to spend these guys and gals to headquarters Marine Corps to get trained, right, right. On, on, on sports science. They come back to mm-hmm. the unit, commander doesn't listen to them. So I think that we have, I think the resources are there, but the problem is that people in the unit, there are a lot of the Marines to implement change. And how do you think we can implement that change or the, the Marines can implement that change? I don't know if it's, a, you know, I don't know if it's the first line course. I don't know if it's Keystone. I don't know if it's the commander's course. Um, mm-hmm. But we need to get <clears throat> buy-in of the leaders because here's right. the deal. They did a study. They did a study at Headquarters Marine Corps of, um, you know, lower extremity injuries. Like why were young men and women getting uh, discharged in boot camp? And what they found was bone density. So bone density of the young man and woman today is a lot thinner than what it used to be. Well, why is that? And lack of activity, right? So you have a young man, right. hypothetically, who's playing Call of Duty. He has an epiphany. He's like, oh, shit, I want to be a Marine. Well, guess what? A 20-mile hike in Call of Duty is not like having a 20-mile hike in the middle world, right? <laughs> and you've been That's sitting right. in your ass eating crappy food, so your bone density is real thin, and then you go to Marine Corps boot camp, and you have all these fractures and crazy stuff, right? So um, diet's different. Uh, activity of young men and women is different, right? So they joined the mm-hmm. Marine Corps with this epiphany of, of what it's going to be like uh, and what they want to do, and their, their, their body and their mind is, is not prepared for it. I, I agree. That's, uh, I think that's uh, the newer generation is more video game centric, mm-hmm. right? So I think they oh, yeah. get that, at least the folks who, who I've encountered – they're like, oh, okay, well, I wasn't expecting this MOS to be like that. I want to go infantry. I'm like, I don't know if you, if you understand what you're getting into, you know, or MARSOC, uh, things like that. But, uh, yeah, they they play the Call of Duty. They want to do these things. And I don't think that a lot of folks are ready for that kind of lifestyle. Yeah, it's different. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not only that. I mean, even in the Army as well, and not just, not just the physical fitness side of it, but, like, implementing anything, right? I remember before I got out – um, I signed up to go to this knowledge management course, mm. amazing course. It's one of the best courses the army's put on hands down, right? Teaches you all about how to manage teams, how to manage projects, how to figure out agile and how to do waterfall, like all these different things, right? It mm-hmm. teaches you so many great skills and you come back to the unit and try to implement those things. And you're right. If you don't have commander buy-in, you have to get buy-in from the top and the bottom. And I was working on the bottom yep. and the top at the same time as a one man person team, trying to implement things like that to, to get them. It's really for just to better the organization. Mm-hmm. And maybe it comes off as, oh, you're trying to take away my power or my responsibility that I have over the organization. I don't know what the the psychological like switch that flips on when you try to implement change in, in an organization, but really it's just like shifting that culture in any way is really, really difficult. Yeah. And especially from the top down, but then also the bottom up. Like you have to you have to hit it from so many different angles and yeah. That's crazy. Do you feel like that carries on into the civilian sector and then also maybe into like some of the VA stuff that you experience as well? Do you feel like that kind of culture shift and that culture blockage um, keeps things from getting better, especially when it comes to holistic mental health and physical health and things like that? So in the civilian sector, I think it's uh, I think it's just as challenging to change um, because what I hear all the time out here is, well, we always do it that way. Uh, and I'm a green belt and the like Sigma. So yeah. um, I had my boss say, well, okay, well, this is how we do it. Um, and that's okay, cool. I was the log IT fam. So I was in charge of all log IT systems in the Marine Corps. I said, I know how systems work. I said, um, to change this field, it costs money. Okay, I got it. I said, and when I change this field, it has secondary and tertiary effects. I'm like, okay, I understand that. I was like, there's testing that has to happen. I got that. I said, but here's what I want to do. Yeah. I said, if I do a project on my off time and I can look at how many man hours are saved, right, um, and how more efficient things become, and I can quantify it and say, okay, cool, you know, this saves, you know, 5,000 man hours and this equates to this much money, then what do you think? She's like, yeah, we never had no one do that. I was, that, I was like, I understand it costs money. I said, but if I can, number one, say that it's actually going to be a cost savings and I can quantify 
the man hours saved and the money saved and the efficiency to the process? She's like, yeah. And, 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 and it, 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 yeah, so I think it's equally hard out here to change, not only to change, but also to maintain change, right? Um, mm -hmm. Equally important. And then, yeah, the buy-in. And it's like, look, I'm willing to put in the time and effort and I can actually quantify the data and show you why this is why this is important and, and how it can save you money. Because out here in the civilian world, it's all about money. How can you save money yeah. and how can you make something more efficient? So I'm like, hey, I'm all about it. I was in the Pentagon. I did studies for four and a half years. So uh, I'm cool. But also people are, are not used to people willing to take initiative out here uh, in the civilian sector. And you got to be careful. You may have the right intent, but other people may view it different, right? It's like you're trying to take over. You're trying to take their job um, or other stuff. You know. And I've actually told someone, I was like, look, man, I don't care about credit. I care about the organization. I was like, I'll do the study. Give it to you. You're the supervisor. If you want to take credit, put your name on it. I really don't give a shit. I was like, here you go. So a lot of people are threatened by initiative as well. So you got to be careful of that as well, how things are perceived out here. I've definitely heard that several times. And, and I work in a civilian capacity now, of course. And you hear that's because that's the way we've done it. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one to, you know, when I get into a new organization, I want to see the processes, the SOPs. Mm -hmm. I want to see how things are done. And maybe there's a way that I learned from my previous command or what I did before that I can implement mm -hmm. in this new place that will help the systems and the processes. That's not always what it's like in new places, right? We've always done it like mm -hmm. this. This is the way the commander likes it. This is the way uh, the boss likes it. I'm like, mm -hmm. what if we look at it this way? No, 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 no. You know, so mm -hmm. it, it is an uphill battle even in the civilian side, right? You, I mean, you encounter mm -hmm. that in the Marine Corps side or the military side. It's just as difficult on the civilian side. Um, yeah. Now, like if you try to do that with your own business, then you have free reign to do all that. But yeah. it is difficult in the GS side as well as the DOD contract, especially the DOD contractor side, because oh, yeah. then you're working for the client who is the, the GS, right? Or the, yeah. the and you're limited in the scope of what you can perform as a contractor. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm here. I'm sit there and, and, and draw and draw what we tell you to do. Okay, Roger that. And I'm okay yeah. with that, right? Because I purposely yeah. wanted to jump into a job that had no like supervision or anything like that, just to try it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Take no that, are, are, Just do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Blindly follow. Um, yeah. In, in your job right now, you, you said you were a GS. Yeah. GS. Is 12. that correct? Okay. Are you in a supervisory position? No. No. Okay. I am not. So, is that something that you were like seeking out like after 30 years of like supervision and like, you know, getting probably getting calls in the middle of the night. Hey, so-and-so knucklehead is doing this. Is that something you yeah. were seeking out like a non-supervisory thing? Uh, so supervisor is something I don't want to do currently. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of want to do my own thing and just you know, come in, go to work and, and whatever. But what I've, so that's what I don't want to do. Uh, however, what I realized is I'll probably end up being a supervisor at some point because I naturally, and I'm naturally a good leader. I'm naturally effective. So even on my team, um, even on my team of individuals, um, I have a supervisor, but I still kind of find myself, you know, doing more leadership stuff, whether it's individual, you know, like helping another coworker lose weight, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so I'm not a supervisor now, but I think, in time, I'll probably end up being a supervisor at some point. Yeah, that, that seems like natural progression. I mean, you have all that experience under your belt. You know, it'd be a shame to not be a supervisor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I work I work remotely, so being a remote supervisor has a challenge as well. It's no different. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's something that I haven't really experienced a whole lot is you know remote leadership. So I'm kind of interested to try and challenge myself by doing that. That sounds. Very interesting and very difficult remote leadership. Yeah. Because it's, it's easy, right? When you are walking down the hall, you can see, oh, mm -hmm. so-and-so is working on this. But you have no idea what's going on in somebody's house or behind a screen or something. Yeah. That's, you know, future, that sounds man. like it has its own challenges. It is the future. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you can be if you can be remote in a remote environment and be an effective leader, man, that's power. 
that's that's pretty cool yeah oh yeah it's, victor victor excels at that he's been keeping my ass in line for months and months now <laughs> no, that's, like, good. that's good hey no no we track. just mesh well together that's all it is that's all it is <laughs> yeah you have a question man so you you've obviously been through the uh, the trs process the transition readiness process and yep. uh, some other services like the army i think they call it tap it's a week-long course yep. it's you go in there in civilian uh business casual attire and you get a fire hose of classes. You get, mm -hmm. you know, anything from financial, you get uh, resources, you know, federal resources, um, you know, on, there's different tracks like entrepreneurship and things like that. What good things did you take away and what, could, how could you make that transition to writing a seminar better if you had the choice to, to redo it all? So number one, I don't think it's long enough. I think it needs to be longer. Um, it is a whole plethora of information, right? It is a fire hose, right? So you're taking, so retirees, you're taking a man or woman who has had their whole adult life in the military, right? Uh, right. For the most part, mo most, most of us, it's a lot of information. I took a tape recorder and I recorded my stuff. Um, I, there's no way I could have written down all the, I could have taken notes, right? And um, so it's a lot, a lot of information, right? So it, it's, I think that you're inundated with, with too much information. Um, I don't think it's long enough. And I don't think there's enough focus on mental transition. So we focus on resources, which is awesome, right? We focus on resume writing, a federal resume, and all those things are important. But we don't focus on is the mental mindset transition from basically going from being in the military for 20 plus years to the civilian sector, like right, right? Let's let's do role playing and let's teach this young man and woman how civilians act, how they think, and what they're going to encounter. Mm -hmm. Right? You're going to you're going to be for the most part a young man and woman who has taken for the last four years or twenty years, who has been told what to do, where to go, how to do it, and the rules and guidelines. And you throw them in the middle, then you throw them out in the middle, in the middle of America with no support system, no structure, no rules, and you say, hey. Figure it out. So you got to figure out the VA. You got to figure out education. You got to figure out um, transition, right? We are we are a people of service. So now you got to find a new purpose. Oh, and by the way, you got to find a tribe because there's no camaraderie in the civilian sector. Mm -hmm. At 4.30, right. they're going home. So there's no focus on mental transition from the military mindset to the civilian mindset in TRS, and that's problematic. Yeah, it definitely is. That's that's. Um, <clears throat> I can I can completely understand with the whole tribe thing, because once yeah. you are out of that tribe, um, it, it's hard to to kind of get into a new one and get into the groove of a new one. Um, I'm sure you saw that from you know going from the Marine Corps to your GS position. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody's out of the office at 430. You need something done. Hey, look, I need some assistance with this. Oh, so-and-so is not here. Wait, that can wait mm -hmm. until tomorrow. You know, yep. so it is It is problematic. And I think, well, let, let me ask, how long do you think would be, TRS would need to be in order to be beneficial? I mean, so basically 10 business days. So five and five, okay. two weeks. And then and as far as like men, mental wise, what, what should they cover specifically? You think they should cover. So things I think are important to cover that I had challenges with hmm. and my other fellow veterans and retirees have had a challenge with is, yeah. you know, okay. Camaraderie and tribe, right? What's that look like in transition? Because tribe's important, but equally important mm -hmm. is having a good tribe. Because if I have an alcohol problem, I don't need to get out of the Marine Corps and go to a tribe that drinks in the civilian world, right? So you need to find a tribe. You need to find a purpose, but you need to find a good tribe. So you need to tell young men and women and, and retirees, here's what's going to be like in the civilian sector. Overtime, mm -hmm. you don't work overtime unless it's approved. Oh, that's right. You ask them to do something and it's not in their PD, they're not doing it. That's right. You know, yeah. you, you ask them you know, to go somewhere after work. Eh. Nine times out of ten, it's not happening. So you, you go from taking a young man and woman in an environment where camaraderie and teamwork are, you know, part of who we are, right? It's interwoven in our in our in our being to the civilian sector where it doesn't exist. Unless you're a law enforcement officer or a firefighter, there's no tribe camaraderie teamwork in the civilian world. So how does that affect you? Keith. 
That's the problem. It affects you hugely. That's why you have a problem with suicide. Do you feel like you're still searching for your tribe? Yes and no. So I'm in the VFW uh, here locally. <laughs> it's okay, right? A bunch of army guys, army retired guys. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, and they're different. They're still good. So I've had to kind of change my opinion of a tribe, right? I don't drink. So I don't go to the VFW instead of the bar. Um, and the veterans, the veterans organizations, they got to change too, right? The VFW and the American Legion, we're no longer, you know, Vietnam and Korea vets going to play bingo and drink at the bar. So that's why you have new organizations like um, IAVI, IAVA, right? Iraqi and Afghanistan Veterans of America, right? Um, is because some mm -hmm. of these old veterans organizations, they have to innovate. They have to modernize. And that's why their membership is dropping. Their membership is dropping and they're closing down places because they're doing the same old shit. I don't want to play bingo. I don't want to go drink at a bar. So unless they modernize and right. innovate, they're going to continue to lose members. They have to appeal to the OIF, OEF generation and the current veterans. Yeah, I completely agree. How could they modernize? What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so Austin, obviously Austin's hippie. It's very liberal, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But they had a VFW mm -hmm. that went to an art gallery, did yoga, and then they had like hors d'oeuvres, you know? You just got to think okay. outside the box. Right. You can't do you can't do um, archaic shit because today's veterans don't want to do that stuff, right? And then another thing too right. with the veterans organizations is legislation. They need to have more legislation that's women veteran specific. Right now, the VFW has they're going to have the first female commander next year at the national level, which is huge. So there's a, there's a lot of women joining the VFW and getting to leadership positions, but the problem is. Our legislation mm -hmm. for veterans, um, for veterans, you know, rights and health benefits, it doesn't address a woman. So when I go to when I go to Iraq as a man, Afghanistan, go to combat. What I encounter in combat is one thing, but the women are a lot smaller than us, right? And a lot, a lot smaller population, but their challenges are different. So in the legislation and in the VA, we have to address them. When a woman goes to combat, it's different, right? We did a study in the Marine Corps about women in combat. What we found was their hips are destroyed. We, dis we discharge a shitload of women because their, their hips are not designed to carry that much weight. Um, so I just think we need to do better with making sure that we address female-specific health disabilities because they're going to combat. Times have changed. They're, in, they're, in, they're encountering combat. And what they affect, the, the effects on them mentally, physically, and emotionally are different than men. With those organizations that you mentioned were one of the organizations you mentioned the IAVA and some of the newer organizations that aren't the, you know, the old school old republic VFWs and things like that. Do you feel like they have that kind of same leverage that the VFW may have in Congress on on Capitol Hill or are they still working on that getting that leverage? I think they're getting better. I mean, they're they're doing some stuff, but I think the American Legion and obviously uh, the VFW have been lobbying, have been lobbying longer and have been around longer. So they have the, they have the leverage and some younger people are starting to get into places in the VFW. Um, but you still have some, you still have some, you don't have a whole lot of diversity. So we need to have my more, more minorities and more women, right. In leadership. And then you still have a bunch of old guys and gals, um, that have an archaic mindset that need to change and realize that, you know, in order to make us an organization successful, you have a combination of the old and the new. And, and we don't have enough uh, new blood in the organizations because right. Right. they're not appealing to the OIF and OEF veterans. Yeah, you have to absolutely have to change with the times, you know, because if not, yeah. they're going to get lost and, uh, you know, other things are going to come up, other organizations like that IAVA. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now, wait, I I want to touch on this this one question that we sent you. And I was it was curious to me because you did 30 years mm -hmm. uh, in the Marine Corps and – the question was, if you could have a conversation with your 16-year-old self, mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you give yourself, your younger self? And you had mentioned that you would tell yourself to retire at 20 years. Yep. I'm curious, you know, you did 30. Why would you tell yourself to retire at 20 by 30? So I'm at 20-year mark. I was at E8. I got pulled from the below zone. Um, mm -hmm. I was debt-free. I was going to retire. The monitor called me, who's a friend of mine, and said, hey – um, do you want to go to Hawaii? And I was at Camp Pendleton. I had just left Miramar. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, uh, I'm an E8. I'm debt-free. I like San Diego. 
and I think I'm going to retire. He's like, we're setting up a new unit in Hawaii, and we want you to go there and stand it up. He's like, go to Hawaii and check it out. Come back and tell me what you think. So went to Hawaii, took the wife and kids. Uh, wife is like, you're an E8, you're the senior guy, no deployments for three years. I'm like, nope. So I called, came back, I called Basque and Brown. I said, like, hey, man, what's up? He's like, what you think? I said, oh, all right, man, let's do it. So I re-enlisted, um, went to Hawaii, um, stood the, uni- the new unit up, which is basically an SSA equivalent for the Army mm-hmm. uh, in Hawaii. At CLB3. And then at 23, I was like, all right, cool, I'm retiring. Came with, I came and did what you guys asked me to do. Set up a brand new unit, new structure, new facilities, uh, everything, right? I'm ready to go. And then my friend who's the monitor is like, still the monitor. He's like, hey, I'll give you orders. I'm like, where to? He's like, it's the Pentagon. I said, nah, man, oh, no. not, not not doing that. I said, number one, oh. I'm very outspoken. I said, I'm tactful and polished, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what I think. And he's like, well, you're an MOS instructor. You're involved in all the conferences, and you wrote, you help write the TNR, and you've done all this education stuff. He's like, we want to make you the Ockfield sponsor in charge of education at the Pentagon. I'm like, no. Nah. I don't want to do that shit. And he's like, well, I need you there. I need you there in February. And this was December. I'm like, so I need to take oh, my wow. wife and kids and travel across the world in three months. He's like, yeah. I'm like, nah, bro, I'm good. So um, then I got orders in less than 90 days. My predecessor had retired early. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, man, I went to went to headquarters Marine Corps. I was in the Pentagon for four and a half years. Uh, doing Ockfield sponsor stuff. We had changed the MOS, MOS manual, MOS roadmap, the naming convention. We had changed structure. Uh, we had upgraded the the GT score. I mean, we had revolutionized an MOS who hadn't done nothing in 25 years. So that was pretty fun and exciting, right? Okay. To be able to change, um, to have that much impact on your MOS. You got right. to sit on promotion boards. Um, I got to, you know, be an inspector on the inspector general of the Marine Corps team traveling their world mm-hmm. and doing supply inspections. I mean, so it was very rewarding, but it was also um, a lot of travel and very stressful. So the last 10 years, uh, the last 10 years of my Marine Corps career, I spent seven at headquarters Marine Corps. No one does that shit. And I yeah, went from the Pentagon to that's a heavy list. I went from the Pentagon to the monitor, you know, two yeah. senior billets, but also a lot of work, a lot of stress uh, that had its toll on um, me you know, physically, emotionally, um, had an effect on my marriage. So yeah, it was, it was, so I would have, I would have went back and I would have told myself to just do your 20 bounce out. Um, and then what I didn't realize is I didn't realize that my military skill set out here in the civilian sector, um, there's lots of money to be made. It's really lucrative out here. So mm-hmm. I didn't realize the amount of right. money that could be made out here. So if I would have gotten out at 38 vice 48, I wouldn't have had to endure the last 10 years of stress, um, mentally, morally, physically, um, and I could have started making money a lot faster. Yeah, that, that is a conversation that I've seen um, many times on Facebook, and, yeah. you know, th- going through groups. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, I'm looking, to, should I retire at 20 or keep on going? You know, what's the money look like on the outside? And I, I wish yeah. I had that post to share on here, but somebody had done, I, I shared it with, with John. Somebody had done uh, the math on that and mm-hmm. to show – how much you actually make at, you know, cause you get like 2%, uh, is it 2% every time you, you do over 20? It's 2.5, uh, yeah. He sh- every year after 2.5. Yeah. Yep. And he showed like, Hey, look, if you were to get like, say a GS job or some sort of DOD contractor job, uh, at six figures, you could be making this, you know, your, mm-hmm. your, your retirement pay, your VA disability potentially. And then your, and then this extra pay, you know, vice your 2.5 every year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah plus, no, uh, I, I completely understand. Yeah, plus I, 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 I agree that age discrimination matters. It's important, uh-huh. and it, it occurs. So it's easier mm-hmm. to transition at 38 than it is at 48. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And how how, how did it affect, like, uh, I'm not going to get into, like, marriage or anything like that, but, like, your, uh, yeah. your family, like, moving across the world, like – how did it affect like your, your kids having to, you know, going to another school and thinking that you, you may be retiring at 20, but no, we're actually going to do more years here mm-hmm. and then moving up to like the Pentagon area. Yeah. So they were young. Um, mm-hmm. It didn't affect them as much because you know, I had four boys. They were, they were young, right? They were all under seven. Yeah. 
Um, right. So it didn't affect them as much uh, at the time. What affected them was obviously um, the amount of travel I did in the Pentagon and the amount of travel as a monitor. Um, so that's what really affected yeah. them more is like, I had, I only had been deployed with my oldest son and my young, my oldest son and my, my next youngest son, my two oldest kids, I was deployed when they were born, um, during their time frame, Right. But the other two, those guys have seen me every day, you know, day on, stay on. Right. So they were used to see me around mm-hmm. to be in Hawaii for three years. Then I go to the Pentagon right. and I'm like, always oh, TAD or I'm always working long ass hours. So they had never really encountered, you know, the work of the Marine Corps per se, until I got to headquarters Marine Corps. And then seven years, you know, at that tempo is crazy. And it had a benefit. So I got promoted, got to see a lot of cool stuff. I mean, you know, went to inauguration, went to the Supreme Court, went, when I went on the Hill, all kinds of cool stuff. But the, uh, I think the, the physical and mental toll it took, not worth it. Yeah. I tend to agree with you on that. I was, I was also of the mindset where I was at a crossroads at some point trying to figure out whether I wanted to do more than uh, 20 because that would have put me at a, at a promotion to chief officer four mm-hmm. and potentially moving to Quantico, Virginia, which I did not want to do. Nothing against Quantico, Virginia, but yeah, I, I went there for TBS. I think that was enough, you know, around yeah, that yeah. area, North Virginia. So yeah, it's, then it's I different. decided, yeah, exactly. it is different. And, you know, we're here in, in Southern California. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. It, it kind of weighing the options, Virginia, Southern California, you know, maybe I'll just stick around here for a little bit. And yeah, uh, I'm good hard. with, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a, you know, life is good around here. Right. So, yeah, no, I, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, man. Go ahead, John, if you had something. Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, this is one of my esoteric questions that I throw in here and it's just kind of a thought experiment about something that's important to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be around the military or what we're talking about here, but something that's just really deeply important to you. If you had the opportunity to put something out into the world, two to three sentences, maybe you knew it was going to hit like a million or two million views instantly. If you just had that kind of platform set up where you could do that and put, project it out to the world, uh, what kind of message would you want to send out to the world? Yeah. So really my thing is, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm big into people, right? People are the foundation of everything. Uh, a lot of time we, a lot of times people in business, people in leadership, they focus on the bottom line. They focus on something that's measurable. Um, you know, my thing really is, you know, I'm a, I'm a student of leadership and I'm constantly learning. Right. So it's not about, it's not about what you say, it's not about what you do. It's about how you make people feel right. Um, in, in the current times with the economy and immigration, a lot of stuff going on, everyone has struggles. So it's really about being kind to your fellow man and woman, right? Cause you don't know what they're going through. Uh, take the time to talk to somebody, right? So we've gotten very impersonal. We text a lot. We're on electronics a lot. So, you know, we go to a resume and you write down a hard skill, you know, hard skills are, you know, they're, they're important, I guess. Um, but equally important are the soft skills, right? Those people skills. And what I've noticed mm-hmm. is that um, those have, those have declined, right? So for me, I would just say, hey, you know, lead with compassion, right? You don't know what people are going through. Um, be empathetic, be sympathetic, make a conscious effort to realize that what you say can actually change a person's life, right? How you make them feel is crucially important. Yeah, man, just, you know, be kind. We're all going through enough shit right now. That's, that's a hundred percent correct. <laughs> yeah. Um, along those same lines, if somebody was type of leader that didn't have those soft skills or didn't have that empathetic side to them where they can understand the other person's plight, the other person's struggles or maybe not even understand but just acknowledge the fact that everybody's going through their own shit there a book or maybe some kind of resource or anything that you would point somebody to to kind of start down that path of figuring out how to be more empathetic and how to build better soft skills um so i don't think there's any book that can really teach you about soft skills um number one you have to have a you have you have to have a genuine desire to want to be better right um, I do like the 48 Laws of War. Uh, there obviously are some very valuable things there. Um, I like Relentless by Tim Grover about mindset, right? Right. Um, about obviously your, you know, your desire to win, how to win, um, all that, all that good stuff. So those are real, those are ones that I'm a fan of. Obviously, think, think and grow rich. I mean, that's amazing. We can talk about business and and how to um, how to change because we don't teach we don't teach about money or financial literacy in the school system. 
If your parents have it, they may teach it to you. You may read books, you may get through friends, but it's not something that's that's out there, right? It's, it's not openly taught, right? Uh, I've had mentors, but I paid for them. Um, they were paid mentors, right? Multi-million, multi-million dollar individuals who had to pay to get their knowledge, right? And they were great. Uh, this one in, in business, for example, he has, you know, 12, 13 business. He's over, you know, a hundred million dollars. And I paid to have access to his knowledge and information. But I walked away learning is that he was great in business, but he's not a good leader. He's kind of an asshole. And I desire to be independently wealthy and to create general wealth for my kids. But I want employees that basically respect me because I take care of them, not because I'm the guy who signs the check. So, you know, thinking grow rich is great, 48 laws of war, and obviously Tim Grover's really limitless, right? Your legacy is about how you treat people, not about how much money you make. Because no one gives a shit about how much money you make. Because tomorrow there's going to be someone who's going to be younger, faster, stronger, smarter, uh, and going to make more money. But how you walk away and make someone feel, that's the legacy. And that's the true value, I think. Yeah, that's what people remember, definitely. If I could throw yeah. out there one one for you, uh, uh, Wayne, I don't know if you read it. Uh, Tribe by Sebastian Junger. It's, uh, it's, it's a really good book. one. It's an amazing book. That's my first one. That's the first yeah. book I read at Window Warrior. Is That's it? Awesome. Oh, yeah. Cause, I mean, yeah, because it teaches you about, you know, about the transition, man. That's about, you know, That's right. trying to find your That's way right. home after war. You know, you know, it's like, yeah, it's yeah, it's a great book, man. And Sebastian Junger has some great speeches, too, on on, on, uh, on TED. Oh, does he? Does he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to check those out. Yeah, he has yeah, some great speeches, That's also... Man. Also, one of the ones, one of the first ones I, I read as well uh, after getting out, because uh, I don't know if you had the same uh, mindset that I did. And it, it was basically, at, I was so happy to to leave, you know, to, to finally retire, to hit that, that pinnacle moment, right? And afterwards, you know, while I was in terminal leave, it was, um, it was like kind of a, a mental thing that hit me where it was um, like, I, I lost my tribe. I lost my... Mm-hmm all the camaraderie. I didn't know what my next mission was. I didn't know what my passion would be. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know what came next. And there was a big fog there in my mind and I didn't know how I was going to get past it. And uh, that was followed up by some, like some depression, things like that. Mm -hmm. Is that something maybe you, you have encountered some time when you left the service? Oh yeah, definitely. There was a, yeah, definitely encountered that. And there was, again, there's no one, there's no one to talk about. There's no one to talk to about, you know, like, hey, man, like, you know, like, what do we do? Like, like, yeah. how do we solve this problem? Like, you know, there's, there was no help. There's no assistance um, in the, in that transition, right? I mean, you're, you're again, you're taking young men and women who have had to spend their adult life in the military. And then at the, at the, I mean, at the instant, when you retire, those chairs go away. Those people go back to work. And guess what? No one calls you. No one's like, hey, man, right. hey, how you doing? Hey, you know, hey, you know, what do you need? Whatever, you know? No. Yeah. The machine keeps moving. They forget about you. Mm-hmm. But That's no one right. teaches you. your spot. Yeah, quickly. Actually, they did it on the last promotion board <laughs> a year ago. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they actually did that shit, you know, a year in advance when you put your papers in. Um, so, yeah, yeah, oh, no, yeah. One, no, one, no one teaches you what to do, how to feel, how to react when all that shit goes away and the phone stops calling. In my case, I was the monitor. So no one's calling me asking about orders. Like, where can I go to? Like, hey, why do I have orders at 29 Palms? You know, why do I got to go to Okinawa? You know, it was like, once you retire, it's like, everything stops. Everyone forgets about you. And you're right. like, okay, shit. Now what do I do? Yeah. I mean, it would be helpful if they would if they would teach you how to mentally prepare for that when you're beginning to retire or get out. Because all you know is you're thrown it, out there and it, you're, forgot, nice. you're forgotten about. Yeah. You know, you're thrown out there. You're forgotten about. And no one teaches you or talks to you about what to do. Yeah, so like, you're forgotten, man. When I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, mentorship. You know, mm-hmm. is there when you were transitioning out? Maybe when, maybe even now. So, do you do you have a mentor that you speak with, or do you actually mentor somebody? Yeah. So, uh, I do have mentors I speak with. Um, you know, other other mm-hmm. retirees that I've, that I've grown up with. I do mentor people, right? So I do talk to the Marines in my community that are getting out and kind of give them advice and stuff. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've always been the guy, man, like uh, I had a mass sergeant who retired. He just had a stroke. Um, I called him up. I was like, Hey man, what's up? How you doing? How things going? And I was like, Hey dude, you know, and he retired, but he had a stroke um, a couple weeks ago. 
And I'm like, hey, what's going on? And I was like, hey, man, I have high blood pressure. I had all that shit too. I was like, you might want to consider doing this, this, this. It really helped me out. Um, so I call, I call retirees and just ask them how they're doing. Uh, and a lot of times they're like, hey, man, you're the first guy who called me in like fucking six months. Hey, okay, man, you know, just want to see how you're doing. I know, you know, you're retired. I'm retired. I just want to, you know, see what's up. I'm like, hey, man, I appreciate it. So, yeah. I mean, I, I mentor people, obviously, that are, that are getting out. And then I have, I have other other mentors that I call as well. And like, hey, what's up? So, yeah, I mean, again, with anything, man, I think that um, if you have knowledge and you've experienced things and you don't share it um, to benefit people, that's really a waste. So, yeah, I try to, I try oh, to share that knowledge. Absolutely. You, have you ever thought about doing like a um, – and, and I know I've, I've talked to, to John about this, and I, and I think John is on, is on board with this as well um, – kind of setting up something during a tap class or a TRS class to like, maybe like a time block um, at like a local base um, to kind of talk a little bit about maybe what you think is missing in these TRS classes. Um, I've, that's been one of my things where I'd contact the, the unit here or the base here and be like, Hey, can I jump in and have like a, uh, can you carve out a time for me to kind of sit down and talk to these potential retirees uh, or mm-hmm. these upcoming retirees about what life is really like a month after you get out, two months after you get out, and let them know that it's it's going to be okay because a lot of mm-hmm. there's a lot of unknowns there. Have you ever thought about doing something like that, like sitting down with these TRS folks and carving up some time to talk to them? So I haven't. Um, it's a great idea. I think it'd be value added. Um, but yeah, man, that's that's something I haven't thought about. Um, I think it's I think that'd be neat. It'd be, it'd be value added. Yeah, man, that's a good idea. I just haven't thought about it before. But yeah, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, because I, I I think you got a lot of knowledge to share, man, when it comes to that. I think if, if that's something that you could, you know, get into with a local yeah. base, it doesn't matter if it's if it's an army base or something like that. People want to know because it's like yeah. it's transitioning out, as we all know, is one of the most stressful slash mm-hmm. exciting slash everything else times in your career, right? There's a mix of emotions and it's like, where am I going to live? How am I going to eat? Where am I going to do? Mm-hmm. How am I going to support my family? A laundry list of things. And yeah. people just need to know, like, dude, take care of these things. It's going to be okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And what I might do, that's a great idea. What I might do is I might, might just uh, do a free group, man, and say, hey, look, if you're, if you're EAS and retiring in the next year, and you want to meet at this restaurant, you know, I recently transitioned and I kind of tell you, I kind of give you some advice to consider and, and tell you how my transition was. Cause it's easier to do in a restaurant somewhere than do it, get permission to go on base. And then the guy may not, the guy it who's is. in charge of TRS may not want to do it, but if you, if you open up free to come to a, to, to a restaurant and kind of hang out and break bread and kind of bullshit and listen, mm-hmm. might be received better. I, I think you're right about that. Cause I, what I fear is going into one of these classes and then just opening up with, here's what TRS is doing wrong. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, yeah. yeah. That, that's that's if great. You, you know, meet up at like. But if you a open up to a restaurant and they just come out and hang out and, you know, yeah. it's not military affiliated, but you're kind of offering your experience and answering questions, probably be receiving yeah. better. But the one thing yeah, I do absolutely. want to cover real quick is um, there's yeah. two things. There's two things you know uh, that would that they don't teach in TRS right for retirees is life insurance. Get life yeah, insurance for this whole life. Or term life, get life insurance before you get out before you vi- before you file your VA claim. Um, so I did get life insurance. I got whole life insurance before I retired. Uh, and one thing I found out was, once you get your VA claim and your VA disability, one of two things happens: you're either uninsurable, or it's very expensive to get life insurance. Mm-hmm. So no one ever told me that, and I'm constantly telling people, it's like, look, man, I'm not going to sell you a company, I'm not going to sell you a plan, but I would definitely tell you to get, especially as a retiree. Get life insurance, whether it's whole life or term life, it's up to you, and you're depending on your financial situation before you file that claim. Because once you file that claim, the life insurance company has access to your VA shit, and you're either going to be uninsurable or it's going to be super expensive. So before retirement, get life insurance. And then for the young Marines, yeah, I'll just tell them, good. yeah, for the young Marines, I'll just tell them, um, go to medical. Don't listen to the bullshit about being ostracized, about being a sick bay commando. Um, I didn't go to medical for my 15 years in the Marine Corps. And that's because my boss was like, hey, man, what's up? I was like, my knees hurt. My back hurts. He's like, go to medical. I'm like, oh, no, I can't do that shit, man. I'm an MOS instructor. I'm teaching these young Marines. So I got to go out here and run. He's like, nah, hell with that. You can go to medical. And they're like, no wonder your back hurts. You have a compression fracture. They're like, no wonder your knees hurt. You have a torn meniscus. So I didn't go to medical to my 15 years. 
So I would tell young men and women, whether retiring or whether they're doing their four years, go to medical, be taken care of. Don't listen to the bullshit. Don't allow people to ostracize you. If you're hurt, go get taken care of. Yeah, that's huge. Because uh, you always hear that when you're younger, right? At, at least I mm-hmm. did. Uh, you, and you're older too. You know, why are you going to medical? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it was always kind of uh, pushed off to the side. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, we, we train here. You know, why are you going to medical all the time? You know, what are you hurt? Yeah. What's going on? And, yeah. And they put you in, you know, they play that role like it's a bad thing, right? Until you're yeah. later on in life and then you mm-hmm. learn these things like, Damn, you know, yeah. I should have went over there for my broken back or whatever the hell you got. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, man, yeah. That's, that's that's just the advice that I'll offer, man, is 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 get life insurance and and if you're hurt, go get taken care of. That's good. And I just got one quick follow on to what we were discussing a minute ago about the TRS. A TRS is a, I guess it just depends where you go, but trying mm-hmm. to get your foot in the door in TRS class or a TAP class to be able to get some time allotted to sit in front of people who are transitioning out of the military is kind of tough and there's like a process to it. And sometimes yeah. you can get through the process and sometimes you can't, I thought I was going to get through the process and, and it didn't happen for me this time around. Uh, I'm going to keep trying around, but that's a, that's an excellent idea that you mentioned about just meeting up at a, a local restaurant or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but absolutely. I did want to ask you hypothetically, if you did approach the TRS or the, the transition office in El Paso, it's Fort Bliss is there, I guess. Is, mm-hmm. is that correct? Yep. Fort Bliss. So if, if they did give you access and said, yeah, we'll give you 20 minutes, you can stand up in front of the, the, the group of people here and, and talk to the men and women here who are transitioning out of military, whether they're retiring or whether they're getting out after three or four years, it would be kind of like the, the thesis of that, that talk because you only got 20 minutes is kind of a limited time. Yep. Um, what would you really want to convey beyond the insurance and uh, what you just mentioned? Um, what I think is crucially important that we are not very good at is articulating our value um, to a civilian company, right? So I would tell these young men and women, it's like, look, what you've done is unlike what your civilian counterparts have done. And we all know that, but it doesn't mean anything unless you can articulate in, ver- in writing and verbally why you rate this job, right? So we don't do a very good job. I mean, you look at, a, you look at evaluation, but when you get a resume... We're like, oh yeah, you know, I was in, I was in, I was in charge of this section. Yeah, okay, cool. Who cares? You need to be able to write. Hey, I was I supervised sixteen people who uh, you know who issued out you know five thousand requisitions, and I improved the process by more than fifty percent in reducing you know this error. So being able to quantify in, in metrics in your resume, right? So basically, resume writing skills. Um, and then, and just tell them, Hey man, what you're doing is what less than 1% of our country does, right? You're selfless. You're, you're serving our country. You're willing to write the check and go to fight and die. And many of our men and women have fought and died in the last 20 years of war. And you are qualified for most jobs, if not all jobs you qualify for, but you have to learn to how to articulate your value in writing and verbally in the interview. And that's where we fail a lot. And we can't write as we can't write a resume very well. You don't very don't we don't do a very good job of explaining um, what we did in the military in civilian verbiage. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree, man. Completely agree. Yeah, because I mean, I had to get help with my resume. It was uh, mm-hmm. I I was just transferring things from my fitness report to my resume, and I'm like, okay, well, nobody knows what an AAR is, right, in the civilian mm-hmm. world or whatever yeah. the, the acronyms are. Yep. Um, report, you know, yeah. And there's companies like that that, yeah, yeah there's companies out there that mm-hmm. who help you out with that, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that that would be essential, man, I think. A, a deep dive into, you know, don't use acronyms, use civilian speak. Yep. Probably utilizing effectively like AI to assist you, right? Like, I use that mm-hmm. all the time for my professional summary. And it comes out way better than anything I could ever type, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just using chat GPT and then, you know, changing keywords so it doesn't look all crazy, right? Um, yeah. No, I, I completely agree. That's that, that's essential. That's crucial, man. Now, I mean, that's, that's Wayne, is, 200... is there anything that we – go ahead. That's, that's been over 200 resumes. Uh, and people are surprised, like, how, did, how the hell did you come in as a GS-12? I was like, it, it took me a lot, but once I figured it out, I applied resumes and, you know, I was like, yeah, I came in as a GS-12. But yeah, it's that it's that skill set. Is that so? You, you figured out and, the secret sauce to the the federal hiring? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm helping people now for free. 
because I mean, I have a friend of mine who's doing it for five, he's been doing it for five years trying to get in. And I'm like, Hey man, look at O three forty three. It's kind of like operations. I was like, you know, I was like, do you have a schedule A letter? He's like, what's a schedule A? Why do I need a schedule A? I'm like, a schedule A is non-competitive. Hmm. You don't compete for a job, bro. You have a disability. Well, I thought that was what, you know, the VA disability letter. I'm like, no, the VA disability letter is to give you 30%, give you 10 points. But the schedule A is non-competitive selection for a job. It's like, no crap. I'm like, yeah. So, hmm. yeah, man. Again, all about passing on knowledge. No, that, that's something good that I, I have. I don't even know. Schedule A. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'll have to yep. look that up here. Yeah, Google I'm schedule A letter, man. You for, uh, it's an OPM. For that. Time is money. It's 100 bucks an hour, man. No, yeah. Awesome. So, so Wayne, is there um, anything that we haven't asked you that maybe you want to get out there to the world about your story, about your life, about anything really message to, to folks out there? I think, I mean, and we covered a lot, obviously, you know, it's been, it's been an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously you just tell, you know, just tell people, obviously if you're in the military, um, take care of yourself, you know, mentally, morally, physically, don't be afraid to try new things. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't against acupuncture. I tried it and it, it improved my, my migraines, right? So be open-minded, try new stuff. Um, obviously read journal um and just the holistic approach to mental health man we, we gotta we gotta take we gotta take more um more time to understand the impact of of a mental health right and you're not weak just because you seek mental health no matter what your rank is uh it'll actually make you a better person and better leader if you seek help and kind of address your mental health issues so uh, there's anywhere you want people to like point people to, to find you online or if they want to reach out like on LinkedIn or anything like that, any links, any, any kind of contact info, I would probably say, don't give us your email address. We don't need that for sure. Yeah. Uh, but anything like that, if you want to point anybody in a direction to find out more about you or to, if they feel like they need to reach out or if they're in the El Paso area and, and maybe want to link up with you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm on LinkedIn. If you look up Wayne Tironis, um, obviously it's a very odd name because Tironis is Mexican and Wayne is Irish. So I'm half Mexican, half white. So uh, everyone always gives me a hard time. It's like, hey, Terones. I'm like, yeah, the Mexico. They're like, but Wayne. I'm like, yeah, it's Irish, bro. I'm half and half. <laughs> Wayne Terones is very is not a Mexican name. Uh, my son name is Victor, and I gave my son my second youngest. His name is Victor. Uh, after my uncle, obviously it's a very strong Hispanic name. So yeah, Wayne Terones in LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. If you Google Wayne Terones, there's tons of shit out there, man. So yeah, good, excellent, man. Yeah, Wayne, it was uh, it was a pleasure having you, man. Uh, we really yep. appreciate your time and your story and all the, the the good bits that you give out for folks out there. I know I'm going to be using a lot of that stuff, especially the the schedule A, which I had no idea. So you learn something new yep. every day, right? So I really appreciate you coming on, man. Thank cool. you for that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, and again, man, if anything, if any way I can help out the listeners or if I can help you guys out uh, personally, professionally, man, let me know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Wayne. And uh, thank you, Victor. And uh, yeah, really appreciate you taking the time and spending the time with us. And uh, apologize. I hope the the circumstance uh, fixes itself, the one that you're dealing with over there, for sure. Um, Yeah. The best of luck with that. Should iron out pretty smooth, though. Cool. But yeah, thank you for for hanging out with us. And uh, for you out there in the audience, you, the listener, uh, thank you for sticking with us as well. Um, if you need to find us, we're on all the social media platforms and we're on all the podcast platforms. We're on YouTube and we also do live streaming on Sundays, every single Sunday, uh, digging into these topics, but in kind of like a live stream forum where you can actually ask us questions and we'll answer them online. So, uh, find us there and possibly reads across America radio on Wednesday evenings. You can see us there. So we're all over the place. Come find us, come hang out. And thank you very much. And we will talk to you all later. All right. Out here.